gentlemen and ladies, Myth Visions, Howard Storm, Franklin Graham, Paul Washer. I am experiencing a crisis of faith. I am in a doubting season. I'm worried one day I will lose my faith and deconvert. I'm so afraid. Well, what's it say in the Bible? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Already, they've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no Moses, that Adam and Eve were fables based upon early myths, earlier myths, and so was the flood story. And if these stories ain't true, why should I not doubt the story of Jesus who met Moses? Elijah and the Mount of Transfiguration if there was no Moses to begin with. Who was the Moses and Elijah if they were not really real life characters? And but something in me just knows that Jesus is the Son of God. Something intuition but it's, is this the Spirit of God? There's something psychologically going on. Is it the Holy Spirit of God or is Christianity a collective effort by collective humanity that just by sheer luck satisfies all the questions mankind has. Why, why is this earth so rotten? Why, why do we die? Why do we want to do good but we can't do good without doing evil occasionally? So, Myth Visions, Derek Lambert, I'll get to the point. I'm reaching out to you because I reached out to Aaron Ra, Matt Del Honey. They just blew me off. They, don't, they, they were afraid to take on my evidence. Well, they were so prejudiced against believing that Christianity could be true, they just were treating to the atheism. You, however, Derek, have a truly open mind. You and Pelogia, you want to believe again, but you simply cannot because of the evidence. Here's the dilemma I am in. If there's no Moses, there's no Adam and Eve, no Noah's flood. Is Jesus really real? C.S. Lewis wrestled with these questions and he concluded that the Bible was true myth, myths. But by the time we got to the stories of King David, they started being true stories. Until we, the time you got to Jesus Christ, Jesus is Lord. I feel God has lied to me. All those years I believed in Adam and Eve. Things were so simple back then. We can, we, you, we, we, you can believe in the prepackaged fundamentalism. It was so easy. Everything made sense. Now everything's up in the air. I'm disgusted with the putrid lack of unity in the Christian community. I'm utterly repulsed and I find it utterly detestable the Christian the cream of the crop Christian community Paul Washer John Piper Franklin Graham none of them can answer my questions I ask my questions or I hear silence crickets I ask the other preachers who love Jesus and they tell me, oh, I'll get back to you. They never get back to me. Are they lying or are they afraid to address my questions because my questions are out of their league? They're, supp they're supposed to know Jesus Christ. They're supposed to know the truth. And if they can't give me the answers, Jesus, are you in the room? I'm angry. I'm disgusted. I'm angry. I'm angry no one cares. 
neither Christian nor atheist gives a damn. I'm sick and tired of all the flaky answers I'm getting. People offering me help but never following through. Always copping out. I'm sick and tired of this. The reason I have not been able to deconvert is because Jesus is everything. I look at a beautiful sunset or like a beautiful live oak tree in a country setting. I think about Jesus. When I, whenever I hear the name Jesus, I feel love. I sense of love, peace, happiness. What I'm trying to get to what what I'm trying to get to is is this a spiritual knowledge that Jesus is Lord? Even though I don't believe in Adam and Eve, even though I don't believe in the flood, even though I don't believe in even though the Exodus and the story of Moses was made up, is this the Holy Spirit keeping me from deconverting? If so, why didn't why the hell didn't he keep all his other atheists to were once Christians from deconverting? Just because they didn't know as much as I do, I know a shit ton more than most of y'all about spiritual things in the Bible. Is that the reason I'm not deconverting? If only if I knew as little as let's say Mythophysians knew when he was before he deconverted, would I have deconverted? If Miss Visions knew what I knew, if Miss Visions knew what I know, would he still be a Christian today? Hey, I thought I was supposed to be what God did. I thought it was, it was supposed to be God's spirit that kept us from deconverting. Not what we know. Not our knowledge. This looks like this looks bad on God. I thought it was all Jesus and not us. I cannot deconvert because there seems to be a power that the message of Jesus has, no other religion has. And this message and this power is so powerful, there have been people that have been killed by this power for refusing to convert to Christianity, for mocking during the days of the revival when the power of Jesus was so strong. People who blasphemed the Holy Ghost and people uh, mocked were killed in mysterious ways. Car accidents. They just killed over and died. And the autopsy could find no reason for them have, having had died. Let me introduce another element. The scientific proof of what are called voodoo deaths. Death by death by belief in voodoo. Voodoo curses. Because people so strongly believe in them that they can actually die. When I'm trying I look it up. There have been people who have died because of voodoo. Documented cases. And they and scientists have th uh, figured out how it works. Something about the adrenaline cause too much adrenaline to get into the blood causing a heart heart attack something like that. It's not fiction folks. If you're not too chicken shit, why do you looking it up? What I'm trying to find out is I'm gonna present three cases of people who were killed by the Christian God for refusing to convert. Some eerie, freaky cases. Freaky cases. What I'm trying to figure out. Were they killed by the Spirit of God? Or were they killed by the same thing that causes voodoo deaths? Was it something totally natural? And just appears to be, to be the Spirit of God killing them? If you're not too afraid to look at my evidence, I beg my little honey. I beg Aaron Roy. I just want the truth. If Jesus is true, I will bow down on my face and I will worship him. If Jesus and God are not true, the asses need to be fucking dethroned once and for all. 
I was conducting a revival, a associational-wide revival sponsored by the 27 Baptist churches in that parish in Louisiana. You know, in Louisiana, they do not have counties like we have in North Carolina. They have parishes. And this was a parish-wide revival. And we had come to the last night of the meeting, and I was preaching this sermon, and the meeting was being held in the rodeo arena. And as I preached, on the last tier of seats, over to my right, on the last row, top seats, were three men that I'd never seen before. And they had laugh and make fun. Now, preacher, it has never bothered me. When a little baby starts crying, the mother gets up and walks out, that don't bother me. But under God, I cannot preach if I see two young people laughing. I cannot preach if I see anybody mocking. It just somehow or another takes it away from me. Three times. I stopped. And I said the last time, if you men don't want to hear me preach, a lot of these people have come from miles to be here tonight, and they do, would you just get up and walk out of the arena? One of them said, if you think you're man enough to come up here and put us out, you just come up here. And I prayed a prayer. Never have prayed before, never have prayed since. I said, dear Jesus, let me backslide for 15 minutes. And I promise you, Lord, if you'll let me backslide for 15 minutes, I'll go up there and beat the devil out of all three of them. And God said, I didn't call you to fight, I called you to preach. He said, you turn them over to me. And I did. And they continued to mock all the way through the sermon. We had over 400 people to walk down that aisle that night and give their hearts to Jesus Christ. I fully intended to never show them enough attention to address them again. But just as I was ready to pronounce the benediction, my arm came up. Preacher, did anything ever come out that you hadn't planned to say? That you couldn't help but say it? <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? But how many of you preachers here have ever had something just come out that you didn't have in your notes and it just, just came out? Yes, every preacher, every God called preacher has. And my arm just came out and I said, I don't know who you three gentlemen are. But all three of you stepped over God's deadline, God signed your death warrant, and God's going to kill all three of you. That was about 10, 15 Sunday night. At 8 o'clock the, the next morning, I didn't know who these men were. They were three businessmen. One of them put the key in the door of his office on Main Street, Ringo, Louisiana, and dropped dead. At 11.30, the second man started across the street to a little restaurant to have his lunch from his office. And a lady was driving up the street and almost ran over him. She said he just walking along normal, fed flat on his face, and died right there in the street. At 5.30 that afternoon, the third man was sitting in his office and he said to his secretary, My two friends are in hell. And before the sun goes down, I'll join them. And he pitched out at her feet a corpse. My wife was with me in the revival. We had closed the revival meeting on, on, on that Sunday night, and we had driven about a hundred miles to a little country church to begin a revival meeting on Monday night. And there were no motels within 25 miles of that little country, uh, that little country church. And we were staying in the home of the of the pastor. We had preached on Monday night. We had come back to the parsonage, we had had some refreshments, and we had gone to the room that had been assigned to us for our bedroom. When I heard the telephone ring, and I heard the preacher when he answered, he said, No, I'm not going to call him to this telephone. He is so weary and so tired, I'm not going to call him. Unless it's an emergency. And the party on the other end of the line said it's an emergency. And when I got there, it was a pastor of the First Methodist Church. And he told me what I've told you. And he said, Brother Harold, our whole parish is in uproar. So we had a meeting with tonight with, with a number of the preachers, and we tried to rent the rodeo arena for next Sunday night, but we can't have it. But my auditorium is the largest, and would you come back next Sunday night and preach? I turned around to the pastor, and he gave me the, uh, the consent to close the meeting on Sunday morning. My wife and I drove back that hundred miles. We left in order that we might get there about 30 minutes before the service to begin that night. When we drove up, there were over 1,500 people in that yard 
They couldn't get in that building. And they said, the people have been here for over an hour and a half, preacher. Not a person, not another person can get in that auditorium. I got down and started walking down, sliding down the aisle, sidewise, my wife and I. And the man that was in charge said, preacher, don't sit down. Just come on and preach. And before I could open my Bible and read one scripture, 17 men jumped up out of that audience and ran down that aisle just as fast as they could get down there, saying, we want to get saved. So very interesting scenarios in these stories. No one, these three men, obviously were not Christians. They viewed Christianity with contempt in this day. They were mocking the preacher, J. Harold Smith, as he was preaching. J. Harold Smith asked them if they don't want to stay in here and listen, would they please just leave? And then and they say, You think you're mad enough, you come up and put us out. J. Harold Smith says that he prayed within himself to Jesus. Lord let me backslide just for fifteen minutes. Now go up and beat the devil out of all three of them. But Jesus told him inside, you turn them over to me. And then he points out them and says to them, I don't know who you three gentlemen are, but all three of you have stepped over God's dead line and God's going to kill all three of you. And then like, one of them was like, oh yeah? So why why they all die in the freaky circumstances, and especially that last man who died, the, the most frightening case hall. He knew he was going to die right before he died. Because he told his secretary, and his secretary later related the story. He pointed out to the sun and said, You see that sun? Before that sun sets, I will be with my two buddies in hell. Whereas the night before he was making fun of Christianity, uh, maybe he didn't believe it. So why did he die? Was it God that killed him or voodoo death? Then he was a so part of him that wondered if Christianity might be true. Because there's something about Christianity, the message of Jesus Christ, that has a compelling force. That forces you to want to believe. Why? Is this because God's spirit is real? Or is this because the message of Christianity. Hits on so many human ner human nerves. That the human being assumes. Hey this, this has got to be true. The question that is dogging me. Lord I'm asking you all in, in front of you. I'm asking Jesus in front of you, All you witnesses. Lord Jesus Christ are you really real? All, all those stories in the Bible about you true historically or the exaggerations are you really real did you really rise from the dead were you really born of the virgin did you never do a wrong thing in your life never sin did you die so that my sins could be washed away are you true are you just some psychological mind game brainwashers I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, in front of all these witnesses, are you really real? In this period of doubting, why in the hell should I go on going home for Jesus? Well, I just don't fucking know. I just don't fucking know. I'll be honest with you. I just don't fucking know. If he, if he's, there's some in me that knows his Lord, but you know, is that spiritual knowledge or is that fear 
and psychological conditioning. If my spirit knows he's Lord, my reason, I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. I just don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. Dad, are you satisfied? Miss Vision, will you please take my case and help me figure some shit out? Because Aaron Ron, Aaron Ron, Matt Dill, honey, we either too frightened of my evidence or they just don't give a shit. They just don't give a fucking shit. About me, because I'm a loser. So fuck Matt Diddle Honey and fuck Aaron Ra. For not caring for me. I hope they die of cancer for throwing me away like trash because they don't see me as a human being worthy of their attention. Hmm. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say this. But if there was no God, and I knew it, and I had a terminal condition, I'd be tempted to kill them for throwing me that way like trash. I'd be tempted to go find and kill them. But they don't think, see me as a valuable human being. They have assaulted my dignity. They have killed my dignity, so I want them to die with me. And don't have any shit, are you, you preachers? Paul Washer, John Piper, Franklin Graham, or you just gotta believe by faith. Check your brain in the door. No, sir, we Bob. If Jesus is the truth, what the hell is he afraid of me learning the truth? Unless he's got something to fucking hide. No, fuck you, God, if you expect me to give up my reason. You go to hell. Go to hell, you son of a bitch liar, if you expect me to give up my reason, you son of a bitch liar. We all know the beautiful story of Billy Graham. He was obsessed with doubts. He was crying. Lord, are you real? Are you real? And finally, he decided, since God did not come through to him, with any answers, that scares me. Is, he, is, is, is God going to not come through for me either? Billy Graham finally said, okay, I don't care what they say. I'm, I'm going to believe that Bible's true. Come what way. Well, guess what? It's a beautiful story. But guess what? There was this Mormon. This man was a Mormon. He apostatized from the Mormon faith. His story sounds exactly like Billy Graham's. He came back to Mormonism. An apostate came back to Mormonism. And he just and he just uh, finally accepted that the Book of Mormon is real. Even though archaeology archaeology does not confirm his stories. And we not and we both know that both Mormonism and Christianity cannot both be true. They are opposed to one another. But they can both be wrong. So why in the hell? Oh yeah, the man who came back to Mormonism. Jesus told him, I gave you back what you lost. Please keep it. Please keep it this time and don't throw it away. Jesus told him that. So Paul Washer, don't have me a shit that only Christians have that inner relationship with God. This Mormon did. So what the hell is going on if Jesus is real? And if, now, now, if Jesus is not real, there's something funky going on in the brain. Collective mentality. But it ain't, it ain't God. And if it ain't, like King Turner says, if it's not real, I do not wish to feel. Why can't he be good to me? George Harrison, who believed in that weird hoodoo Hindu shit. Alright, I don't know. None, uh, he said, Mother Mary told him, just let it be. Just let it be. Everything will work itself out in the end. Sounds to me that it's, it's the same goddamn thing the Christian God is telling his Christians. So if 
the Christian God is telling us some, the same thing all the other goddamn false gods are telling us how do we know he's not a false god? God's supposed to be holy, which means Kadesh, separate from all the other bullshit gods who are not real. But God's not living up to his name, and I'm disgusted with this goddamn God. I curse this God for this. I curse him. I curse him also for not making me a good looking guy. Now my desire to be sin and be a good looking guy if the, I could be accused of one of the if, if I if, I'm not going to let this cause me to leave Jesus Christ but my desire to sin and be a good looking guy have the long forms and have the uh, six, sexual satisfaction of having the long forms and the long one talking about the skulls I denied Jesus once for us this in Boston in 2018. I got Jesus back. Although I'm not, I had no intention of denouncing Jesus again. Just as long as I don't lose him, just as long as I get saved, uh, end up being saved in the end, I will curse God till I die. If I did not become a good-looking guy, that means so much to me. And God, God, loved, God apparently loved King David and gave him his sexual satisfaction with all his multiple wives, and he won't give me mine. Be a good looking guy. I don't give a goddamn about extra heavenly rewards in heaven. God can keep the gifts. Give me my satisfaction now. Just in case he ain't real after all. There's the two near death experiences. One by Howard Pittman, a born again Christian. And one by Father Shire, a Catholic priest. They both parallel the hell out of one another. But the characters judging him are different. So what the fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on? God, I curse you God for this confusion. God is not the author of the confusion. The Apostle Paul wrote, God, are you a, God, are you a liar? Or was Paul not inspired by the Holy Ghost when he wrote that? And God, I'm the, God, I curse you for your putrid, unloving children. Paul Washer, Franklin Graham, John Piper, who are not answering my questions. They're supposed to, they're supposed to have an inside track to you, and they can't answer my goddamn questions? What type of God are you, you loser? Fuck you, God, you son of a bitch. But if Jesus is not real, why does Christianity have a power that not even Hinduism has? Not Voodoo, not Mormonism? Now Islam, none of these religions, all these religions have a persuasion factor that can make you love their God and know that God is real. But something about Christianity goes a little bit deeper. Christianity is the only religion that can make you know that you know in your intuition that Jesus is real. Christianity, nobody... Uh, it's like everybody knows that Jesus is Lord, they just don't know it. That's why when people deconvert from Christianity, they had nightmares. Nobody who deconverted from Mormonism or Islam had nightmares of going to hell. Nobody who cursed Allah or Muhammad was killed by a freakish heart attack. Or a car accident within 24 hours. Only in Christianity. So if Jesus is not real, what the fuck is going on? What is going on? And what really I find detestable among God's illegitimate 
retarded children. Oh God, they're retarded children. Yeah, they're, yes, they're retarded because they they were weren't retarded. They wouldn't be so stunted in their knowledge. They're retards. I I start asking these questions. They get defensive. They get angry. They retreat in their, to their feel good theology. They curl up into the shell. Like a retarded child retreating into his fantasy land because he can't handle reality. Look, if Jesus is real, there are answers to every goddamn one of my fucking questions. And if I can't get those answers, either Jesus is not real or he's He's afraid of me finding out the answers. I put my finger at you, God, and curse you. I don't get bring your wrath. You son of a bitch! Just give me the peace of mind and know the truth. I'll take your wrath just as long as I know the truth. Just please don't give me your eternal, everlasting wrath. I'm disgusted. Both atheists and Christians. Neither one of them know enough to satisfy my quest for knowledge. Every one of them are sadly lacking. Every one of them are one egg short of a dozen. And sometimes when they try to, sometimes apologists, I listen to apologists, but I smell the rotten egg of the dozen. Fool me once, God, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Are you real? Are you real? Why can't I get the answers? I'm begging for answers. That are true. Not answers that just seem to be true, but are, is there such, like power asked Jesus Christ, what is truth? But did Pilate actually ask Jesus Christ or did, did the writer of John put those words into the mouth of Pilate? I just don't know what's fucking true on you anymore. Why is it? The disciple Polycarp was supposedly a disciple of John the Beloved himself. Yet, Polycarp quotes from the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the first John or second, third one, some of several of Paul's epistles, and yet not once does Polycarp quote from the book of John. That bothers me. That makes me wonder if John, the book of John was written in the second century instead of in the first century. How come... Is it because Polycarp didn't know about the book of John that he never quoted them because it had not even been written yet? And Polycarp died in the second century. So many doubts. I'm not going to go over them in this video, but I'm putting them in the head that had just Jesus, if Jesus is real. I will say this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. If you're real, I give myself totally to you. But if you're not real, if you're not really real, then I curse the God the Father, I curse God the Son, and I curse God the Holy Ghost to go to hell. And if I'm, I'm angry, I'm angry. You owe it to yourself, God, to get me out of this pit. If you don't, if you don't do it because you love me, that breaks my heart. You don't love me, God. You love yourself. That's why you do it. Because you love yourself, not because you love me. Fuck you, you cunt. Can I please at least have the good looks if you don't love me? Can I please be a, the good looking guy, have the long forms, and have my sex satisfaction down here and be getting to heaven at the bottom of the totem pole? Fuck you. I, God, I curse you for making me timid. It makes me feel so good when I, when I can curse God like this and God doesn't punish me. Maybe that means God does love me. It makes me feel good about myself. 
like I'm a tough guy because I'm always run away with my tail between my legs when somebody confronts me but if I can stand up to God like this that, that makes me feel good about myself maybe that's why God lets me curse him like I do because I know he knows I'm a loser and he's giving me a little good karma But instead you stood up, you spit me out, you kick me down I hate your death, what about me? Ah! They said to kill my soul, they ripped my heart from my chest Left me to rot in the grave, sure don't I never stay Very deep in the knees People won't silence me, not watch me fight Cause I'm in a dead of night, take back a run, give them a run Another thing I've noticed. If God and Jesus are supposed to satisfy every meet every need, why in the hell do so many damn cream of the crop Christians, Robbie Zachariah, Jimmy Swaggart, turn to adultery and fornication to satisfy a need that God cannot satisfy with himself? I've seen a shitload of deconversion stories. Some of them are laughably bullshit, weak. Others, like the I, I, the like I, one I just listened to called this. He was a pastor for thirty years. He used to pray every morning. I mean, if Jesus is real. I, I, was try, I was trying to excuse it. I was trying to justify Christianity as being true by saying, all oh, these people who deconverted, they went out and gave their life to Christ without truly, uh, fully understanding who Jesus is. And maybe that's true. But I've heard other deconversion stories that cast doubt. These people knew who Jesus was. And if they didn't, God is playing a good goddamn game of hide and seek, divine hiddenness, making it impossibly hard to find him. This God who supposedly wants everybody to be saved. Well, God, why, do you, why don't you save everybody? When I was in eighth grade, Dr. Bruce Phillips my PED teacher, I had done something, I, I told him I wanted to change, and I was going out, I, I, was, I had just done something stupid, busted a tennis racket, and he's like, Chris, you said you want to change, but if you really want to do something, you will change. Goes for God, too. I mean, look at Jimmy Swagger. Powerful man of God. Committed all he, but God cannot satisfy that need for sexual satisfaction. I understand what Jim Swagger is feeling. I gotta be a good-looking guy. I gotta have the low arms. Even with Jesus in my, my my life, I got a supreme satisfaction. But for Jesus did not give me my good-looking good looks. I want. Uh, I've, 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 I've. I don't want to curse God, but if I can't but not be a good guy, I curse God. I don't want to lose him. But the Bible says the Lord. He gave King David all his sexual satisfaction, all his multiple multiple wives. He called David a man after God's own heart. And yet David has a sex drive from hell. And God satisfied that sex drive. He even against God's own law, Deuteronomy 17, 17, which commanded that the king was not allowed to 
multiplied to himself wives and concubines. He, he, uh, he never once rebuked Solomon for doing the same thing. I thought this God was supposed to be pure and holy. Why is he letting these? Why is he weaken at King David, a man of the God of his own heart, who wrote, "Thy word have I hid in my heart that I, that I might not sin against thee." And yet, so much of the theory, God wants one wife, one person, one wife, one husband, monogamy.